G'day, I'm Kama. And I'm Blowy. Blowy, Blowy, Blowy. Good morning, David. How are you? Doing well, Blowy. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Um, I'm in Williamstown today in uh, Melbourne, and um, that's a, an old um, Navy ship behind me there. And it's a beautiful day. We've got blue skies. It's very cold, though. This morning it was like negative one degrees. Um, how about you? Um, well, it's warm, but grey skies here. It's going to be uh, like just like literally two minutes ago. It was really coming down hard. And I was worried about the audio. Do you remember our audio problems from episode six? I do. That was my fault. My um, phone's for some reason um, stopped recording the audio, but we've always got backups, so um, we'll see. I'll have to check it today though, just to make sure it's still recording. Um, but yeah, let's, um, today we're gonna talk about um, it part of a two, two part series. This is part one. We're gonna talk about David, Cam AKA Camera, how he um, got the job of his dreams. Um, so, David, first of all, let's um, have a quick um, chat about how you actually became passionate about the job of your dreams. Yeah, well, that's a story in itself. So, let's, let's go back a fair way, actually. And I'm going to go all the way back to, uh, I think it was year six. Me and my mate Horace, we we're from Redcliffe and we went to Humpy Bong State School. And there's a mall in, the, in, uh, in Redcliffe. And in this mall, there was, uh, it kind of been refurbished, but it was on a back street. And I remember talking with Horace in front of my teacher maybe. And we were saying something like, oh, they should have made the mall on the front, like on the seaside. It would have been much more popular, I reckon. And I can't remember, but I think it was my teacher. And he said, why don't you write a letter to the local paper and tell them what you think? And we said, really? And so we penned a letter together. And in year six, I got my first byline. It was in a letter to the editor of the Redcliffe Herald. Now, do you still have that uh, letter with somewhere? S sadly, no, but I could definitely get it because I know in, um, in the Queensland State Library, they have a microfiche machine. Yeah. Uh, in that microfiche machine, they have uh, all the episodes of the Herald. Wow. So, so you it could... might take a little while, but um, I have I have searched um, old stuff and found it. That would be a great day, great day out, wouldn't it? Yeah, because most of my other clippings I've kept. Yeah. Well, maybe would it'd be good to um, film you going through the um, the microfilm and. Um, you know, it'd be like a um, like a uh, drama, TV drama, like you, a journalist going through the old microfilm, and it's like you're trying to look for something really, really important, and then uh, <coughs> yeah, like to find for this investigative journalist trying to solve the murder, and then I found it, I found it, and everyone's like, oh, what's this journalist found? Oh, I found a letter to the Herald from myself. Yeah, that's a good gag, Blowy. Yeah, I like that. Anyway, yeah, continue. It's got legs. It's got legs, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so, um, that was the first one I remember. And I remember thinking, wow, that's pretty cool to get your name in print like that. Yeah, famous. And then I, th then I think it was n grade eight. I, I wrote a letter to uh, Mad Magazine, the Australian Mad Magazine. Oh, can I, can I just stop you? I didn't know there was an Australian one. And American, I just thought it was the same one. Yeah, so I think it was like probably 70% of the American content. Yeah, okay. And then they just added a little bit of extra Aussie content in it. And the letters to the editor and everything was uh, clearly different. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. But they also, um, yeah, so I, I, um, I asked then, I said, oh, be, it would be mad if you could do a uh, parody on uh, Home Alone. And at that stage, I hadn't even watched Home Alone, but I knew it was like a pretty big movie. It was like one of those uh, ones that was like, 
I guess, I mean, it was a bestseller, everyone. A well, blockbuster, sorry. Oh, but, classic. Um, classic. Yeah, classic. Absolutely classic. But anyway, um, I think in a couple of months afterwards, they did actually uh, print that. So anyway, I had a bit of a... Um, I've got some cows looking at me. Are they cute? <laughs> um, they're all just looking at me. They're very curious. There's four of them and they're just staring at me like, what the hell is he doing? Okay, now they've kind of looked at me. Two of them have turned away. Yeah. So, um, anyway, I kind of got a bit of a taste for getting my, my uh, name in print. And after that, because of rollerblading, we got in the paper a few times. You did as well. And uh, the second thing was the show Media Watch. I used to watch Media Watch with Mum. And Media Watch is an Australian television show where they keep an eye. It's a bit of a media, uh, a watchdog for like uh, newspapers and uh, broadcast journalism. But they had this uh, QC named Stuart Littlemore who was presenting it for a long time. And he was really sarcastic. But um, even as a kid, I just thought, I, I found him really funny. And so, you know, it was 15 minutes every week and I would sit down and watch that with mum. It was really uh, enjoyable. So that's the backdrop. All right, so, so, so now we've um, seen Lil Kammer um, wanting to be a journalist, but um, was it an easy path to, so you just finished, finished school, went, went to uni, got a job, is that what happened? We haven't even got to the point where I'm interested in journalism yet. Oh, so you because, won't, um, this was the planting oh. the seed, was it? Oh, I mean, I was kind of interested in watching the media, but I definitely didn't think about a job in journalism. I remember one of my school friends, after we finished high school, she started doing uh, journalism at uh, the, one of the universities in Brisbane. And she came by one night and said, you know, oh, we have to do a story on someone we know. So, you know, you're, you're quite interesting with your rollerblading and everything. I was thinking maybe doing a story on you, if that's okay. I said, yeah, that's fine. And I, I remember at the time, I was just thinking, I'm so glad I'm not you. Like, that just sounds like an English assignment. Like, I'm so glad I don't have to write these kind of things. Just, um, just quickly, I'm just entering the, the Botanical Gardens now, the Williamstown Botanical Gardens. Uh, Bita Botanic Gardens. Is that the same thing? What? Botanic? Yeah, Botanic Gardens. Did you, did you say Botanic? It's, no, Botanic. Botanic. Yeah, like, bot like botany. Yeah, like botany. They're quite, quite beautiful, actually. They've got, um, they've actually got something that links us to what we're doing now. They've got a, oh, it smells amazing. The, um, the herbs, the herbs. <laughs> um, it's, no, they've got a tree here, which is a, um, cherry blossom tree, which is actually planted from, by someone from Japan because I, I believe it's um, a Japanese um, sister city or something like that. It's, um, uh, it's planted by Masayuki Sujiura. Oh, Masayuki uh, Sujiura, okay. The mayor of Anjo, Japan. Yep. Yeah, so there you know go. Know him well. Yep, there you go. So that's how and we're... I I found some more uh, she, uh, sorry, shiitake stacks in, this, in the uh, forest. Oh, no, no, it's kind of like there's a bar across that I don't want people going down there, but I can't see any from back here either. But anyway, they got the stack of logs in the forest. Oh, the logs, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, you'll see it later on when you edit this. So it's man-made and they, yeah, well... We're going to have a, um, I'll give you all a little, um, a little nugget here, but we're going to have a special guest on in a few episodes and he's going to talk about, um, about farming mushrooms. Ah, yes, that's right. Uh, amongst other things. Yes, and uh, lots of you viewers who watch this uh, really carefully will recognise this name. We shouted him out in a previous episode. Now... I've just got something else I want to show the viewers. Now, the, the Australian viewers are going to get this, but 
Um, if you're not Australian, you might not. It's probably a bit difficult to see. I wonder, there's a magpie. Yeah. Now it's an Australian bird that um, attacks you. And when I say attack, they're quite violent and they um, come flying, swooping at your head and they like can make you bleed. They're quite aggressive sometimes. Um, as a kid, quite scary. That's a, actually an interesting segue onto uh, one of my first jobs. Well, my first job in media. I uh, got a front page story because a magpie was going to be shot by police. And you're saying, what? <laughs> what? Uh, so, a bird? So the basic, yeah, the basic story is that um, a young girl was walking through a, uh, uh, like a nature corridor and she got swooped by a magpie and it also drew blood. And so her father was really upset about this. And he, um, so he, he came to the newspaper and I was the journalist assigned to this story. And he was saying, oh, you know, this, we got to destroy this, uh, this bird, it's a menace. And um, his daughter was there, she was a high school student. And so I asked her like, okay, tell me about it. And she was just, I could tell she was not into it. This was all her dad's campaign, but he dragged her along and uh, I had a photographer there with me as well. And we said, okay, could we get a photo of you two in front of the tree? And she didn't want to be in the photo. So we got him, he was there like fuming in front of this tree where this magpie was. And um, so he was, on, <laughs> he was on a mission, this guy. He wanted this, uh, this bird completely destroyed. And so he did his research and basically found out that yes, if, if it is a, um, a dangerous bird that does hurt people, and you can prove that, then the bird can be destroyed. So armed with all this knowledge, uh, he went down to the police station and showed them the photos and showed them the relevant part of the law or whatever. And so they kind of reluctantly said, yeah, so we're gonna go and shoot it. And I said, you're actually gonna go and shoot this magpie. And he goes, yeah, and I asked how, you know, they're gonna get a rifle and everything. And uh, a, a senior sergeant was going down and uh, take a shot at it. But um. There was so much uh, outrage in the community after this story was printed that the uh, magpie's life ended up uh, being saved. Wow. And because, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, magpie is um, protected species in Australia, is that right? Yeah, so. And I, I really felt sorry for the girl though, because I heard that she got bullied at school about it as well. They call her magpie girl or something? Oh yeah, Oh. Who hasn't been swooped by a magpie or oh, harden up? And in <laughs> actual fact, she didn't want any part of this. No. It was completely her dad's campaign. Dad. Dad was a, um, on a v vendetta against the magpie. He maybe had, had some um, deep um, stories back from his childhood where he got um, harassed by a magpie, potentially. But I mean, who didn't? Oh, who didn't? Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm at the beach now, Kama. It's beautiful, beautiful day at the beach, and um, oh, it's freezing, but it's just a beautiful day. I'll just show everyone, you'll be able to see it later, but beautiful Williamstown Beach. But let's, can, let's um, get back into the story. The rain's picking up again over here, Joe. Oh, okay. At a, uh, another sweet potato farm. Oh, sweet, sweet. Sweet potatoes on both sides. See what I did there, Kemmer? And, yeah, I think you should tell the story because it's going to get a little bit noisy here. Yep. It's going past the poultry farm. The poultry farm? Which story? Oh, you said we're going to return to the story. Oh, no, I'm going to ask you some questions. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so, let's... Um, I just want to quickly hear that, um, like, how you became a journalist. Like, was it easy? Um, did you just finish your course, get a job, start working? Um, yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, no, 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 but I, I haven't even started about, I haven't even told you about how I um, decided I wanted to be a journalist yet. Well, hurry up and tell us that and then answer my question. Another little goat here in the rain. Poor thing. Hello. Poor thing. Oh, they're, they're pretty tough goats. They don't mind a bit of rain. Don't they? No. Okay. Anyway, um, so I had uh, went to university and did a business degree. I didn't really know why, but it was kind of because it led on from a uh, course after high school that I did that was a business course, a diploma. 
and I didn't really know what else to do and I thought well a degree is going to be worth something especially considering my really bad marks from high school and so about six months before I got this degree I just remember thinking what the hell am I even doing this for? I'm not interested in it I'm studying human resource management I guess I'm interested in what drives people to choose their careers but yeah I don't really have an interest in working in human resource management and um, so I just said well I'll just get this degree and uh, at least I've got a degree and that will help me uh, I wanted to do a bit of travel or whatever so that'll help me travel get overseas it's often a visa requirement to have a university degree so I went to Vanuatu for a while I went to uh, Japan teaching English and um, I bought myself a digital camera and I've been taking lots of photos and you had a camera at the same time as well and uh, I also bought myself a laptop and started making this uh, website well I made a few websites actually and basically lots of my spare time was just uh, dedicated to uploading content creating content making photos uh, using Photoshop to make images funny or write little essays about things I'd experienced and travel logs and things like that and I remember coming home from work as an English teacher one day and jumping on my laptop and starting on something like this and just thinking to myself it's a pity I couldn't get paid to do this because I love doing this and then for the first time it struck me like this is pretty much what a journalist does hang on all those Tintin, Tintin magazines flash before your eyes those um, Media Watch um, bloody Mad Magazine did everything just kind of come to the forefront of your forehead but yeah so that moment I was just like so clear I was like why haven't I even thought about this before like it seems so obvious like this is and the more I thought about it, I said yeah hell yeah that's what I want to do so that was I think it was about 2004 that I had that realization and so I wrote it down I told people I'm gonna be a journalist and um, it was gonna it was going to be another seven years before I got my first uh, paid gig as a journalist. Seven years. Yep, so now can we go into um, how you became a journalist? How you, yeah, so <laughs> the bit everyone's been waiting for. Yeah, so, okay, moved down to Osaka. And I met up with an old friend, Evan. And Evan uh, had always been interested in video cameras. And he'd been working uh, for one of the channels on the Gold Coast as a news cameraman. And so he showed me some of his videos and uh, told me some stories. And I was just like, oh man, you gotta help me. He goes, yeah, of course, man. So um, I said, first off, I wanna buy a video camera so I can start making proper videos. And he said, all right, how much do you want to spend? And I told him how much I was willing to spend, a bit over a grand. And he said, okay, I, I would buy this camera if I were you. It was a little uh, three CCCD uh, uh, mini DV that shot on a tape. And- um, Brand new yeah, or second hand? Brand new. I didn't want to get a second hand one. I didn't want any um, problems with the video or anything like that. So, um, just waiting for this truck to go past. All right. Um, well, while you're waiting for the, oh, it's gone. I've got a few trucks trying to pass me at the moment as well. Yes. Well, the, my truck's gone past. So, um, anyway, um, I bought this video camera and I just started carrying my camera with me everywhere and shooting whatever I came across. And, um, I remember having a conversation with you actually. And I was like, okay, what do I need? Because you done, you must have done a little bit of video already. And you told me you got to buy an external hard drive and a DVD writer. Because I didn't have a DVD writer on my laptop. Oh, didn't you? Yeah. No. So I was like, okay, I'll get those two things. So, um, oh, is this, looks like corn, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so yeah, so anyway, I, I bought this camera and started making videos and uh, I basically taught myself how to edit on um, an NLE, a non-linear editor. And I started making videos, so I made these uh, 
DVDs called the Big Camo DVDs. And these Big Camo DVDs, they were basically, you, I used to basically uh, make them about half an hour and they were kind of like a, a bit of a compilation, a variety show. And so some of the things, like, I would just kind of have a section on, uh, you know, a little trip I did or I'd do some night uh, time lapses or something like that. And I'd put them all together on these uh, DVDs and spray paint like a stencil on the top, on the front. And I also did liner notes that I did on like an A3 sheet of paper and then folded it up into a little booklet and photocopied them. Or my, like a little zine that went out with these DVDs. And I reckon like every big DVD, uh, big camo DVD, I would have sent at least 20 of each disc off to friends, family, people around the world. And uh, hoping that they kind of pass them around to other people. So it's hard, it's hard to know how many people watch them. And in those days as well, YouTube, um, I think it was YouTube. I didn't find out about YouTube for another couple of years after that. But even in those days, YouTube only allowed you to put um, a maximum of 10 minute clips up. So these half hour clips, which also had, uh, I didn't really look into copyright or anything like that. So they would have had music just from my regular collections um, that I couldn't put online anyway. And I started to buy all these journalism books as well. Uh, I went to a university uh, homepage and I'd been really disillusioned with my business course. So I remember thinking like everything here I could have learnt just by picking up a textbook and reading it. So I said, I'm not going to make the same mistake twice. Instead of going back and studying at a uh, institution, I'm going to teach myself and just read books and create content myself. And so I did that. I bought heaps of books online on Amazon and read them cover to cover and started looking at every kind of uh, bit of journalism as well. I saw I was looking a lot more um, analytically at everything and uh, looking at the, the uh, shots, sorry, the uh, choice of shots they used and how they transitioned from one shot to another and how they, yeah, they did all of that. Um, so all these big camo DVDs, I remember dad calling me. And he said, mate, why don't you do like a proper, a proper video rather than like, these are just little funny little discs you're sending, but why don't you do like a proper story? Like on that guy you learnt bamboo weaving from. And this was uh, Tanaka Kyokusho. He was a guy who I'd uh, tracked down in Tokyo when I was, cause I've, I was interested in bamboo for a different reason. But I was, I found this guy who uh, agreed to teach me how to make things from uh, bamboo. And so, he was incredible. And so when dad said that, I said, yeah, that's a good idea. I floated the idea to my wife, Junko, and uh, she said, yeah, go for it. So um, that meant buying a Shinkansen ticket, heading up to Tokyo for a few days. And uh, it was, uh, he was keen to help me out, but I had the feeling at the time he was like humoring me almost like, yeah, okay. I'll, sure, I'm happy to help you with your little project. And so I made this video. It took probably half a year. It was just very difficult because it was about maybe six hours of footage. And I had to condense it down into half an hour. I'd never done it before. And you're dealing with so much stuff. And I was obviously all of the interviews I'd done in Japanese. So I had to kind of think as well how to uh, translate all that. Or... Well, I did the translations last. Like I, um, that was the last thing I thought about. Yeah. Well, because you don't want to waste your time translating if you're not going to use that cut do you exactly yeah um but i kind of assembled it into a rough order and i kind of kept playing around with it until i was happy and so probably half, half a year later i'd made this uh, 30 30 minute uh, video and so i uh exported it put on a dvd and sent it off i didn't send it to him for approval or anything but i remember i remember sending it off to him um just just quickly camera I'm on the end of a pier now, and um, there's some nice boats, people, people fishing. Good to see people out fishing again. Um, yeah. Oh, and someone said no photos, so I'll just turn around. It's not really a photo, but <laughs> maybe, maybe they're doing something um, a bit sus out here. So you never... Anyway, sorry, continue. Yeah, so... Um... I sent this off to him and he was, uh, he got back to me really quickly and said, wow, 
Like this is really impressive. Like he was, he was really impressed with it. Like he wasn't expecting that much. So um, he asked me, he said, look, we're celebrating the hundredth anniversary of our shop now. Do you mind, uh, oh, would you be happy for, to use this um, DVD to kind of uh, promote that? And I was like, oh, I said, yeah, I mean, use it however you like. And he goes, okay, can you get me a few copies? Because he was going to hand them out. So um, I, uh, I got a huge stack of DVDs from the electronics store, blank DVDs, and I must have done about 50 or so, burnt 50, and uh, sent them off to him. And um, at that stage, like, I wasn't even thinking about, you know, how much the DVDs or postage costs. I was just like, yep, I'm happy to get this out to as many people as possible. And so I did this big stack for him and he took them over to the US, I think, with him when he was uh, doing some kind of uh, some kind of show over there. And uh, yeah, it's uh, this this video, though, I've since uploaded it to YouTube and it's still my uh, the most popular video on my YouTube channel. Oh, really? Yeah. So put it, so you'll, I mean, put, you'll put a link to it? Up. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, I was doing this kind of stuff. I made a few other little documentaries and stuff. But eventually, I kind of... I'd also been writing uh, letters to, like... Uh, I wrote a letter to the correspondent, the North Asia correspondent for ABC, who was based in Tokyo, and said, you know, I'm willing to help however I can, and even if that means carrying a tripod or whatever. And I never heard back from them. Um, but I was also in touch with this dude who was doing, uh, all these, uh, it was quite interesting actually. I'd seen online, he'd been to Vanuatu and he'd done an expose on, uh, one of the cruise ships dumping, like, uh, oil and stuff illegally in Vanuatu. So I reached out to him and said how awesome, how impressed I was with the story. And, uh, I told him as well, I was trying to get into journalism and he said, okay, there might be some, uh, options. So he kind of agreed to kind of, uh, mentor me from afar. And uh, he was interested in me being in Japan because um, he, he got in touch with me. He said, look, mate, we're doing this series. Uh, we'd need you to go into a, like a, uh, a busy part of uh, Osaka uh, and uh, pretend you're a tourist who's lost. And we just want to show that how tough it is for like backpackers when they're overseas and they get into trouble. Yeah. <laughs> said to him, look, mate, I know Japan very well. And I can tell you how this is going to go down. Yeah. <laughs> is someone who's busy and in the middle of something important is going to turn around and wait take me all the way to wherever I need to go and um, if you're looking for an angle where they're going to um, you know ignore me or something it's not going to happen in Japan trust me and um, he was like oh okay well the angle they want is kind of that and I was like what, what do you mean the angle don't you just do these things and see what happens and then report on it yeah no nah, not in Japan that's everyone's so helpful over there like you yeah and it's like everyone that goes there knows that yeah and he also wanted me to try to track down um c chapelle corby the woman who was convicted of uh smuggling drugs into bali um he wanted me he told me that uh she had an ex-husband who was japanese and so he was a surfer and they wanted to interview him but they were having a hard time getting in touch uh, in touch with him Guard dog. Go on, Burke. Sure I don't go in there. Go on, Burke. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I um. Oh, got some cows here as well. I uh, I said okay, I'll try to look into it, and so I found out where this beach town was that he was last seen, and I, I said who would know him, and I thought okay, I'll, I'll try the local surf shop, and so I called the surf shop, and um, and I kind of hung up I think because I thought oh no no. I don't want them to know my mobile number. Okay, yep. I found their an email address and sent them an email saying, hey, I'm looking for uh, this guy. Uh, do you reckon he'll talk? And uh, they kind of sent one back saying, oh, who is this? What do you want to talk to him about? And so they weren't really letting on, but it was obvious they knew him because they didn't just completely deny it. And then I told, I told them kind of how I was hoping for him to kind of share his side of the story about the, um, you know, his time with Chappelle and everything. And I just didn't get a response. And I thought, well, I could go up there, but it's not like he's going to talk anyway. And, uh, you know, I didn't really feel equipped to go up there by myself and uh, start hassling these people in this place I didn't really even know. So I kind of just like dropped off contact with this guy. 
but still it was still uh interesting to see he kind of helped me see how some of the inner workings of you know the news gathering process worked yeah nice um hey camera can we um can we pause the film for a second i just need to go to the toilet busting okay when it gets cold you have to go to the toilet so let me just uh are we gonna are we gonna actually stop recording or i can leave it recording yeah leave let's it. stop there because we're at half an hour all right well we're gonna stop are we yeah and talking about leaving the uh, inner workings of the uh the news gathering process we're gonna leave this part of the uh, video in see we don't have any secrets to hide so you can see that this is uh raw and how we do it we can uh, revisit the rest of my uh, foray into the journalism sector in a future episode that's right as they say is it um peeling back the curtain or something or yeah the fourth, third wall or something or what do they say in the business i'm not sure well we're we're the we're the fourth estate i think i'm not sure if these are edible or not they look pretty juicy little berries yeah well yeah if, if you don't know don't eat it that's kids no. if no, any no. kids are watching don't eat anything you don't know all right it's a good lesson good lesson kids yeah um okay all right well we'll see you next week and um we'll tell you what it's about then secret for now okay all right see you camera see ya bang bang, bang.